So today's chapter in the story of Ruth takes us to the threshing room floor. This is a chapter filled with double entendre. The narration would send a frizzle of excitement through us. It's a little bit risque. Later on in your Bibles, the threshing room floor becomes associated with prostitution. And we want to tend to want to avert our eyes to skip to the next chapter. Most of all, you've got to hide it from the kids. But what happened that night on the threshing floor is as essential to understanding Ruth's story, my story, as what happened on the highway from Moab to Bethlehem. And it is as essential to understanding my story as to how Boaz took note of this impoverished widow as she gleaned and gave her special privileges to glean in his field. At each of these points in the story, we had choices to make. We could choose to bless or to hurt. We could choose to act with love to those around us or we could choose to be selfish. We could choose to act as God would want us to act or we could choose to act in our own self-interest. And so in order to fully understand my story, you need to hear the chapter that happened on the threshing floor. Now, coming up to this episode in my story, it will be helpful to remember who is the real story, hero of this story. Now, we were always trying to do what was right and best as we lived out our day-to-day -day lives, but the true hero of the story is not the one the book was named for, Ruth, and it's not Naomi, and it's not Boaz, and nor is this really a story about courtship and romance, as is often presumed. This story is a story about God, it's a story about God's work in the hearts and lives of people who follow him. And this chapter in the story is no different. When you come to the scene of the threshing floor, it also runs you up against unfamiliar customs, which may jar your modern senses and obscure what's going on. You need to know about concepts such as a kinsman redeemer and what purpose they served in the world I lived in. And you also encounter unfamiliar marriage customs, which make it harder to see what's going on. A word to the wise, marriage in my time was not about romance. Marriage in my world was not about two people celebrating their love and commitment to one another. It was about solidifying strategic alliances for families. And in doing so, it would provide important benefits, including social, economic, and political advantages and of course, marriage gave the promise of children and heirs. In addition, we have the custom known as Leverite marriage, which was designed to both protect the heritage of a man's family line and may have had the added benefit of providing for a widow if she was left without a husband and sons, which of course was the situation that I found myself in and Naomi found herself in. We were widowed and I had no sons or daughters. I had no children at all. And there was no other brother in Naomi's family who could marry me to produce a son to save the family line. Naomi and I were completely alone in a world, trying to make our way together. So when Naomi left Moab for her hometown of Bethlehem, she urged my sister-in-law Orpah and myself to return home, to return to our families, and to try and make a better future for ourselves there. And Orpah did return home. But I could not leave Naomi to suffer by herself, and so I refused to leave her. And I bound myself to her with an oath that I would never leave her nor forsake her, not even in death. It would be she and I against the rest of the world. And I knew that together, with the help of her God, we would get by. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew it. But that's not to say that we didn't have to work hard. Putting food on the table was the first order of business. And luckily for us, when we returned to Bethlehem, it was the beginning of the barley harvest. The very first day I went out to glean, I picked up the scraps of the harvest and I was hoping to get enough just to feed us for one day. And I know that it was dangerous. I'm an outsider. I'm someone who's not from around here. And so if there's anyone that people were going to pick on, anyone who they might try to harm or take for a ride, I knew that I would be the first in the line for this kind of treatment. I didn't know anyone, and so I would be reliant upon the goodwill of other people. 
people who weren't entirely sure that they should trust me, people that I didn't look like or sound like, being a Moabite, which is a code word for an outsider. But what else could I do? Naomi needed to eat. And so I gathered all my strength and I went out early in the morning and I picked a field at random and I began to work in it. As it turned out, the field that I picked out totally by chance was the field of a man named Boaz. And it seemed to be a coincidence, but as they like to say, a coincidence is a miracle where God chooses to remain anonymous. And Boaz was more than kind. He was more than just. He, he not only agreed to my bold and risky request to allow me to break convention and gather sheaves of barley after the harvesters before the women who worked with him went through and gathered them into bundles, ensuring that I would find a lot of stray grain. It seemed that his harvesters even went above and beyond, and I even caught a few of them out of the corner of my eye taking stalks out of their bundles that they were cutting and lay them down so that I could pick them up. Even more than that, Boaz took a poor, widowed foreigner that he had no reason to know or to trust, and he fed me lunch with his harvesters, and he offered to let me drink the water that the harvesters had drawn when I was thirsty. It turned out that God was providing for his newest child, me, in directing me at random, or so it seemed to me, to pick the grain in the field of the most upright and devout man in Israel. It turned out that God was looking out for me, and out looking out for Naomi, no matter how bitter the years had made us. The day when I began to work in Boaz's field was my first lesson in the ways in which God provides for his people. And that day I was so grateful to take back to Naomi over 30 pounds of grain. That was almost too much grain for me to carry home. And not only that, I brought her the remains of my hot lunch that Boaz had served me. And it was a night of great rejoicing in our little household. And Naomi was very curious about who had been so very kind to me and allowed me the grace to get so much grain from his field in one day. And not only that, to feed me lunch and to leave me with the offer of continuing to glean grain in his own fields from then on. And I told her who it was, and she was shocked. She revealed that somehow the grace of God had directed me to the field of someone who was her near relative, someone who could fulfill the duties of her family to take care of her and to provide her with an heir for her dead husband. This man might be the answer to all our worries if he would fulfill that duty. But make no mistake, even though Boaz had been more than kind to me and had given me every advantage as I worked in his fields, gleaning was hard work. Sweat poured down my face and I was always at the mercy of the elements. I worked long and hard, and after I'd spend the day bending over and gathering and collecting whatever I could from the fields, I would have to go and thresh the grain that I had gathered. And that too was hard work. And then after all this, I would return home at dusk with whatever I had gathered, and Naomi and I would eat for another day or two. God provided enough that we had enough for every day, but we certainly didn't have an abundance of food. And I knew that it worried Naomi every day when I went out gathering that something bad might happen to me. And the loss of our husbands and her sons is never something that you really get over. Sure, you can move on. Sure, you can continue to live your life, but it's always going to be a part of your story. I couldn't work hard enough and bring home enough grain, and even the goodness of Boaz was not enough to erase the pain of our past. And I would hear Naomi cry in her sleep, and I couldn't help but ache for her. She'd had so much taken from her in her life. She felt totally hollowed out by her life in Moab. But slowly, she had begun to revive here in Bethlehem with the simple joy of having a meal, of having a supper to look forward to, and our company with each other. And Naomi's faith, as fragile as it was, was beginning to recover. But this joy always existed alongside the pain of our past. Joy and pain in one picture. That's the nature of all of our lives. And so Naomi and I live day after day, week after week, eking out an existence and finding goodness and joy and blessing wherever we could. And we lived through the barley harvest and then through the harvest of wheat. 
and Boaz was as good as his word. He graciously allowed me to take home enough every day that Naomi and I ate and were provided for, and we were prevented from the worst ravages of poverty. And it was more than we really could have hoped for. But even though Naomi had revealed that Boaz was our near relative and that he might be able to save her family line, he had made no move to do so. He was kind, more than kind, every day when I went to glean in his fields, but that was as far as it went. And for a time, that was okay. We managed pretty well throughout that summer and fall. But at the end of the wheat, as the end of the wheat harvest was approaching, some of Naomi's old anxiousness came back, and she began to wonder what was going to happen to us next. We had a little bit of grain put away because of the great kindness of Boaz and allowing me to glean normally, more than I normally would have under regular circumstances. But our, would our meager stores of grain last throughout the winter when there was no harvest? What would we do when the skies turned rainy and the weather cool? I believe that we would make it through. God had been more than good to me, more than good to Naomi in allowing us to find Boaz, and I was happy with Naomi. I was happy keeping her company and looking after her needs, but she was really worried about what was going to happen next. And so one day, Naomi finally let me in on what was bothering her. Dear daughter, she said, isn't it about time I arranged a good home for you so you can have a happy life? And isn't Boaz our close relative, the one whose young women you've been working with? Maybe it's time for us to make our move. The time to winnow the grain had come. This was the end of the harvest, and this was a great celebration. It was within Naomi's own lifetime that there had been no crops to harvest, and the lean years had turned into a famine. But the Lord had finally sent rain, and there was food once again in Bethlehem. But when you live in an agricultural society, you always keep your eyes to the skies because farming can be cruel. And in everyone's not so distant memory, there had been no crops. And so when you bring in a harvest, when you finally get to the point where you can winnow your grain and count the piles of what you have to set in store, this is a time for a party. It's time to celebrate the Lord's goodness. It's time to thank God for the harvest. It would be a little bit like your Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's celebrations rolled into one. We were so thankful that the Lord had provided crops. And so when you finish your winnowing, there's party and food and feasting and sweet desserts and drinks flowing. It's a big celebration. And so as this party approached, Naomi began to hatch a plan that she thought would help us in the next stage of our lives. As we said, Boaz had made no move to redeeming me, and so Naomi decided that it was time for us to take matters into our own hands. We had to work together, she and I, to make things happen for ourselves, as we'd been doing ever since Naomi left Moab, and I followed her. And the plan that Naomi hatched led me to the threshing floor. As Naomi explained the plan to me, I was totally amazed, because Naomi was going to give me up. She was going to give me the one who had been providing her with food and company and love. But she was so concerned that my future in Bethlehem was in jeopardy, that being a widow with a history of barrenness and being a foreigner and with us just scraping by on whatever I could glean, she didn't want that to be my life for the rest of my life. She wanted to give me the security that only a family could provide. And so she was willing to let me go. And this might mean that she would be left totally alone. But even out of her poverty, she was willing to make this sacrifice. She was willing to give away the only thing she had left going for her. And I love my mother-in-law, and I know that I had made no mistake in agreeing to stay with her. I had poured out myself for her, and now she was going to pour herself out for me. But Naomi's plan was risky, if it went wrong, my reputation would be ruined. No one at all would agree to marry me. And I could lose even the meager things that I had earned in this community, the right to glean richly from the land of a good man. If he turned me away and I lost this, 
I lost all the security Naomi and I had in this world. Naomi's plan was a gamble. It was a flip of the coin. It was going all in on a hand that might not win. But she thought it was worth trying, and I trusted her completely, and I agreed to do what she said. But her plan had even more danger about it. Her plan included putting me in a potentially compromising situation. She told me to wait until Boaz had enjoyed himself at the party after he had feasted and had enough to drink, and then I would watch to see where he would lie down. And then under cover of darkness, I was going to go to where he was lying, and I would slip under the covers with him. And Naomi told me that once he saw me there, he would tell me what to do. It was almost a crazy plan. Any number of things could go wrong. But I didn't want to think about all those things that could go wrong. I did my best to put them out of my mind. I would risk my life and my name on that flesh threshing floor at midnight, just as I had done when I was on the road to Bethlehem, just as I had done when I'd gone out to glean in whatever field I could find. This was the next step in trying to provide something for Naomi to rescue her family line. And so I poured myself out for Naomi. I agreed to her plan. I took off my widow garments and I dressed up like I was going to a party. And once Boaz saw me, he'd be sure to get the hint. I had finished my mourning and I was available for marriage once again. And I got dressed and I went to the threshing floor and I waited for Boaz to appear. Maybe God would be good to me, just as he had done so far. Maybe, just maybe, our risky plan would work. I went to the field and I watched as the winnowing was finished and the party began. And I watched as the feasting began and I watched as the party got livelier and livelier. And I was nervous about my part in this production, and I tried not to think of all that would happen if our gamble did not pay off. And finally, things began to wind down, and I watched as Boaz slipped away and found a private-ish spot to lie down for the night. And I followed him, and I waited some more until the gentle snores and sighs alerted me to the fact that most people had nodded off. And I went to where Boaz was, and just as Naomi said, I slipped in beside him and I waited for what would happen next. I was surprised that the hammering in my heart did not wake him. I did my best to lie beside him calm and still. And finally, he did awaken with a start. And he realized that he was not alone as he had been when he laid down. Does this part make you want to look away? Does the intimacy or the risk of impropriety or the chance that things might get out of hand or even... The fact that if we did conduct ourselves uprightly, the risk of anything untoward in our appearance, the possibility that wagging tongues could ruin my reputation, does this all make you uncomfortable? Certainly it was a risk I was taking, and if Boaz had been less of a man, it could have gone terribly wrong. And if there had been a lot of other choices for Naomi and I, this certainly would not have been the plan that we lighted on. But isn't that the case in our everyday lives? People who love God are often in murky and difficult situations. Our lives often present us with hard choices, and we have to decide how we're going to live out our everyday lives, decide whether we're going to be guided by self-interest self or if we're going to allow loving kindness to dictate our actions. Will we freely sacrifice for other people that we love in God's name? But that night, through the grace of God, the worst did not happen. Boaz was indeed an upright man, a man of valor. Who are you, he asked when he awoke. Now Naomi told me that he would tell me what to do at this point. But I took matters into my own hands. When he asked me who I was, I answered, I am Ruth, your maiden. Take me under your protecting wing. You're my close relative, you know. In the circle of covenant redeemers, you do have the right to marry me. Now that probably sounds a lot different in your world than it did in mine, but what I did that night on the threshing room floor was propose marriage to Boaz. I didn't want to leave what would happen next to chance. I told him exactly why I was there. This was not going to be a midnight tryst. 
I was there because I wanted a future for Naomi, just as much as she wanted a future for me. That's why I was there. And so I broke protocol, I broke the rules, and asked him to go ahead and fulfill his duty to the family, to Naomi, to Elimelech, who was Naomi's husband, and yes, even to me. I asked him if he would marry me and raise an heir for Naomi. I asked him if he was willing to save Naomi's family. Now, the very first day that I met Boaz in the field, he had said to me, I've heard all about you, heard about the way that you treated your mother-in-law after the death of her husband, and how you left your father and mother and the land of your birth and have come to live among a bunch of total strangers. And he said, God will reward you well for what you've done and with a generous bonus beside from God to whom you've come seeking protection under his wings. So he assured me, who was a foreigner and an outsider, whose people had been enemies of his people, that his God had given me protection under his wings, just as God protected his own people, just as a bird protects her chicks. Those great wings of God's protection were extended even to me. As a poor woman from another country, my situation was dire, but I was not forgotten by God. That is what I'd learned about God so far. Even though he hadn't said a word in this story, he acted on our behalf, and I knew that God was on the side of people like me and Naomi. The way that God cared for us shows me that God cares for us even when the world is indifferent to us. God had provided for us through Boaz before. Boaz had been the face of God to me and to Naomi when he showed me kindness. And now I reminded him of that. Just as Boaz had said that God has spread his wing of protection over me, I now use the very same word back to him that he had spoken to me. And I told him to take me under his wing, to spread his protecting wing over me. God's divine intervention might come to me in the form of Boaz if he was willing, and I reminded him of that as I lay beside him that night, risking my very self on this gamble that Naomi had devised. And for his part, he recognized that this is what I was doing. And not only was he receptive to the plan we had made, he recognized that I had done everything I had done out of my love and commitment to Naomi, that I was pouring myself out for her. And he recognized that, and he even called me a woman of valor, a woman of worth, someone who had made the choices she made out of love. He saw the ways I'd been faithful to Naomi, and he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. This instance of your loving kindness is better than the first. You have not gone after young man, whether rich or poor. And Boaz promised that he would do all that I asked. He matched what he saw in me with faithfulness of his own. And he said, yes, of course I'll marry you, except, and here in our story, a wrench is thrown in. You see, we had long wondered why Boaz, who had shown me much kindness, had not approached us with this kind of offer already. And now we found out why. There was another man who was closer to Naomi, who had the first right of refusal, and if he chose to redeem us, then Boaz could not. But Boaz promised that he would get that matter sorted out as soon as he could, and he promised that if that man declined his duty to Naomi's family, then he himself would do it. So once again, he showed his great character. Now, of course, I knew how compromising the situation that we were in was, and so did he, and so he sent me home before it was too light outside, and people might recognize me. But he didn't send me away empty-handed. Just as on that first day that I'd met him, he loaded me with grain to take back to Naomi. And so you will have to wait to find out what happens, how Boaz will sort out this matter with the other relative who so far had not made any move to help out Naomi in her poverty. And it turns out that we didn't have to wait long, but you will have to wait until next week and see how the story will play out. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Dear God of love and faithfulness, we thank you for your love for us. 
We thank you for the ways that you show our lo your love to us in the everyday situations in our lives, in the ins and outs of trying to live each and every day. We thank you for the ways you provide for us, so often through the love and care of other people. Help us to recognize the ways in which you act for us through other people, and help us to show love and care and faithfulness to others, and thereby become the face of God for them too. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. As you go this week, may the peace of God reign in this place. May the love of God hold you forever tight. May the Spirit of God flow through your life. And may the joy of God uphold you day and night. Amen. Go in peace.